Um, I think we might get started, but maybe if someone can just close that door at the back because there's a bit of background noise coming through. And if you can't hear, then maybe you should just move forward a few rows if you're right up the back. But yeah, just yell out if you want me to speak louder. Well, um, my name's Erica Bremham, and I am a web developer. I sort of was formerly a site builder, but now I do a little bit of PHP. So, um, but this talk is totally about building websites with no custom code. So it can be done, and it's Drupal makes it fairly easy. It's just a little bit hard to get past the first initial uh, steps. So um, I reckon we'll just get started. So. There is some important background information, but I'm going to skip it for the presentation because you can read it at home. And I think I want to get stuck into just actually building something to show you that it is actually pretty easy to build a functional website without uh, any custom code. So the slides will be online and you can read them at your leisure. Uh, it, I mean, I guess the topics, maybe I'll just quickly go through them. So introduction to Drupal, what do you need to install Drupal locally? What do you need to install it on an external server? Uh, the terminology and jargon. So maybe actually if I use a word that you don't understand, just put your hand up and ask and I will explain it. So because there's some words that are Drupal specific that you may need a bit of help uh, actually working out what they mean. Uh, the Drupal file structure and then some information about modules and themes, the cache, administering your Drupal site and I've just got a big list of recommended contributed modules, which are the ones that I use in my site building uh, every day. So let's go to part two. And this is our site building. So the first thing we're going to do is install Drupal, except I'm not going to show that because it's kind of different depending on what operating system you use. I would recommend using uh, Acquia Dev Desktop if you haven't done any development before because that will get you set up with a Drupal installation really easily. You just kind of click through the steps, download the software, and then it's there. So I've got one that I can show you. So if we, I've installed it, and this is my Acquia site that it's set up for me. And you can log into it. Just uh, start, I think I set the password as admin admin. Oh no, it's not working. Oh well, we're skipping that one. So I actually use a program called MAMP. Uh, there's a free version which lets you, which is kind of a light version of this. So this gives you PHP and it also gives you uh, SQL, which is the database. And it gives you Apache, which is the web server. So if you don't understand what those three things are, then I would go with the dev desktop, or you can pay, I think it's about 90 bucks for MAMP, and that gives you a more advanced interface, or the free one, uh, it's a little bit more complicated to set up, I think, because you only really get one site, and it's a bit harder to create multiple sites on your machine. So, I have uh, set up my site with Drupal, and when you install a new Drupal site, you get to this screen. So, normally you only get two profiles, standard and minimal, um, I've got this one here called DC SID, which has got just a couple of little helper things that I've put together for this presentation. Um, if you, minimal comes with kind of nothing enabled, just the bare minimum, but standard comes with a few things enabled, like there's a page content type and I think an article content type and some of the menus are also enabled. So depending, you might want to try installing both of those and seeing which ones you want to work with. So. I've already set up a database, so if we go to SQL Pro, I've created my database and I've called it naked, so there's no tables inside it, but Drupal needs the database already there. And then if we give it our name and your database username and password, which in my case it's root and root, which is the case for most local installations but not all. And then just let it do its thing. So now we can put in our site information. So I'll just autofill this. Uh, 
and I might just turn off these notifications because I don't want my computer to notify me if there's stuff out of date for this test site. So that's it, Drupal is installed. That was pretty quick and easy, but it may not be so quick and easy when you're trying to do it at home. So I think maybe um, if you've got a local user group, it'd be a really good chance to have a go at setting it up. And if you get stuck, go along to the user group and then see if you can get a bit of help with someone there because that's possibly one of the harder bits is getting it all running on your local computer. So uh, this is my site and there's kind of nothing there because I've installed it with just the absolute bare minimum enabled. So I'm just gonna show you how to download a module from, and I'm gonna get a module called admin menu. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, there we go, that one's working. So there's a bit of contention about what people like to use as an administration menu. Um, I flip between them, but this is the one that I like using at the moment. So this is what a module page looks like on drupal.org. Uh, there's some information about the module, what it does, uh, there's usually often a link on how to uh, install and configure it. So the first thing we want to do is we want to download it. And I'm just going to grab this uh, tar file. You'll see that there's a version number and this one has RC4 on the end of it. And that means it's a release candidate 4. So it's not a s technically a stable module, but it's kind of, it means that it's, you know, it's almost getting pretty close to being stable. So. Some people might say you shouldn't be using this in production environment, but I think because we're mainly using it for our development, then I'm not worried too much about that. So I'm gonna copy this module and I'm gonna find my website. So this kind of gives us a good chance to look at the file structure. So this is Drupal. Uh, the directory that we're gonna focus on is this directory called sites. So we go sites and then all and inside modules. And I'm actually gonna create a new folder called contrib. And that's where I'm gonna put all of the modules that I download off drupal.org. You can just put them straight into modules, but it's good to get into the habit of making a contrib directory now because when you become awesome and you start making custom modules, you want a way of differentiating your custom modules from the ones that you download. So now that I've put it in here, um, I'm going to go to the modules page. And where are we? I think it's called administration. There we go. So I'm just gonna check this button and press save. And this modules page is a kind of a bit unwieldy, so there's another module that I'm going to enable, and I think I've got it here. So this is a tool called Drush, and it lets you do things pretty quickly from the command line. This is advanced, so I'm just using it to make this presentation flow a bit faster. You can just continue to download modules and install them in the way that we just did. So. So I've downloaded the wrong one. Actually, I think I've already got it in my downloads. And I'm actually gonna delete this admin menu out of here because I already have a copy somewhere else and it may make my website break. Alrighty. 
So if I refresh this modules page, you'll see that now it looks much nicer and it's quite easy to find modules that you want. So if I was looking for that administration menu, which is gone again, Um, I'm just going to clear the cache because I've moved a few things around. So hopefully I'm not going to get a bunch of nasty errors on my website, but maybe that would be a good kind of test. And then I can solve it. And there's our administration menu. So what that one's done is it's given us this menu up the top here. There's a couple of other menu options. So if you're not too convinced by this one, I'd recommend having a look around and seeing uh, finding one that you like. I think there's a module called admin and then there's also the default Drupal toolbar which comes with Drupal 7. So now that we've done that, we're going to, um, we want to be able to make pages on our website. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a page content type. Now if you install the standard profile, you already get a page content type. So this is kind of more of an exercise in how to do things because I think if we start really simple and then build up. so. We're going to go add content type and we're just going to call this a simple page and you can put some help instructions for your users so it's often a good idea I usually do this at the end but it's usually a good idea to put some instructions because um, often users you know they may not know what a page does so for example this is for pages like and And our title field label, we'll keep it to be called title and then optional preview before submitting. Uh, you can set it so that the node is unpublished by default and then you have to manually publish it, but we're just going to leave everything as default. And this promoted to front page. So uh, the default Drupal front page is kind of a list of all the nodes on your website that have been promoted to the front page. Uh, we're going to change that in a little bit. So I'm just going to leave this flag here and then We'll keep this one on there for now because we're also going to change that later somewhere other way. Now our page is okay, but I think I want to add a file attachment field to the page because um, users might want to put some file attachments on their fields. So I need to enable a couple of modules. So perhaps I'll just go through these slides uh, and get up to the place we're up to. So we're going to want some modules called field, field UI and file. I think field's already enabled by default, but these UI modules are kind of like, it stands for user interface, so you can't actually do any administration on your website unless you've got the UI modules enabled, but you can disable them again on your production website when you're all ready to go live. You can turn all those off, so. I've enabled both of those, so now if we refresh this page, we get an option to manage fields. So. We're just going to add a field called attachments. That one will do. And I like to prefix my fields with the name of the content type. So we'll call this page attach. It just kind of makes things neater when, you're, when you've got a site with hundreds of fields and you're trying to find things later. So it's kind of, I think it's a good habit to get into, even if perhaps you're only building small sites for now. So um, there's quite a few options in these fields. So the attachment gives you an option to display it. So if you want to display it on this, if you want to display it by default, uh, or if you want the users to be able to choose not to display that attachment for some reason, maybe they just wanted to put it into the file system. But I'm just going to leave all of this as kind of the default settings. And then I might add, let them upload PDFs as well as text. And I'll let them upload as many files as they want. So let's save this one. And now if we go add content, we can create a page. So let's call this page about me and we can give it some text. And we can also attach a file. So upload that one. And then if we save this one, there we go, we've got a page and we have a file attachment down the bottom. But this is kind of 
not fantastic because maybe the user wants to put some links in their page, maybe they want to make some text bold. So you're probably going to want to add what's known as a WYSIWYG to your page, which stands for what you see is what you get. So we're going to enable a couple of modules. Um, we're going to enable one called WYSIWYG. Now, if we go to the WYSIWYG page, all WYSIWYG is a wrapper module for a couple of WYSIWYG libraries. So there's a bunch of different ones to choose from um, and you need to download them externally. So generally when you download a library, uh, you put it inside sites. So we're in sites all and then make a new directory called libraries. And then you can put all your libraries into this one, but I've already got it in, a, in my installation profile. So I don't need to download it again. Um, and I don't need to enable anything. I just, it's just there. So when the module needs it, it knows where to get it from. So if we go to configuration, content authoring and text formats. Uh, see, this is one reason why I don't like this particular menu. So I'm just going to make one called WYSIWYG. And I'm going to let authenticated users use the WYSIWYG. I don't want our anonymous users to be able to do anything. There's a few options. We can limit the HTML tags. So this is kind of good if you want to stop your users from being able to put stuff like iframes into the content because they can yeah, make a bit of a mess. But the one thing that always gets me is for some reason this doesn't include a key tag in the, <laughs> in the default settings. So I always, I always just enable it and then wonder why my p tags get stripped out of my content every time I try and create a page. So save this one. And then we're going to set this text format up to use the WYSIWYG. So you'll see because I've got that CK editor library there, that becomes an option. You can install as many libraries as you want. So maybe you've got some users that prefer to use a different li a different editor. So you can uh, you can have um, TinyMC is another popular one. So you can let them choose which text format they want to use. So save this one. And there's a whole heap of buttons that we can add. So I might just give them bold, italic and underline for now. So if we add a new page, you'll see that we've got this, our buttons up here. So we can uh, maybe chuck a sentence in there and we can make the first word bold if we want to. And I'm actually going to call this page home because I don't really like the default front page of the Drupal website at the moment because it's just kind of a big list of our content and not very useful. So one hard thing for beginners is to work out how to change that because it's in a kind of an obscure place. So we go to configuration, system, site information, and then we put in the, your, the node address of our page. So I know that it's the second node I created, so it's going to be node two. And now if we go home, here's our home page that we created. So this is also kind of a bit of a crap front page because you might want to have some blocks and stuff. Um, I would really recommend you go to the panels presentation that Jen Lampton is doing because panels is really awesome for doing things like laying out your front pages with nice little blocks. And um, I'm not going to cover panels at all in this because I think it deserves its own full presentation. I think that one's tomorrow. So we've got our pages. That's all good. Um, I'm just going to enable a feature which has got a little bit of stuff so we don't have to keep recreating things. So the next thing my website wants is an events feature. So we're going to, I've already partly created this events content type with some fields. Um, a title and a body is not very useful for events. So I'm going to add a date field to start with. So I'm going to enable date module. And I'm also going to enable date pop-up, which gives us a calendar. And if we refresh this page, then we get a date and we're going to choose our pop-up calendar. And I'm going to keep this as as is because maybe someone has a sh has an event on that starts at you know 10:30 in the morning. So I also want to collect an end date because maybe they, it's 10:30 to 11:30, but I'm not going to make it required because maybe they don't want to put in an end date. Uh, just going to leave all of this as it is and 
save that. And I also want to add an address. And there's kind of a, there's quite a cool module called address field, which lets you collect an address just with one field instead of having to make individual fields for the postcode, state, city, etc. So address. And it says postal address, but you can use it for street addresses as well. And one thing I am going to enable here is the organization. So I'm going to use that as the venue. So we'll save this one. And now we can create an event. There we go, album world premiere. And let's have that on Saturday night. And you can set up your date formats. I'm pretty sure you can set it up so that it doesn't use 24 hour time if you're not really into 24 hour time. There we go, Sydney Opera House. And we have our event here. So as it is, this event's not very useful as a single event. Um, we probably want to have an events page that's going to show our users all of the upcoming events. So to do that, we use a module called Views. So this is probably one of the most important modules that you will learn how to use. So I'm enabling Views and Views UI. I'm also going to enable a module called Date Views, which just gives us more control over date fields within views because by default you can't do things like saying uh, I only want to show things with a date from now onwards. So now that we've enabled those, we're going to add a new view and we'll call it event. And we're going to show content of type event sorted by newest first. And then we're going to create a page and I think we'll give it a menu link to in the main menu. And we won't worry about a block. So currently, it's only showing one event. So I think we might generate some content. So there's a useful module called Devel, and that comes with a module called Devel Generate. So I'm going to enable that one. And this is really useful for site building because it lets you just in one step generate a whole bunch of content. So if we open that one up in another page. So let's make. 20 events and now if we refresh this page we should get a whole bunch of events down here. So I actually want to, I don't really want to sort them by post date because that's not very useful. I want to sort them by the date field. So let's remove that one and then add our date field that we added earlier and we'll just use start date. And then we'll sort ascending, so they're going to get bigger, which means going from now to further on in the future. But this is also still showing all our past events, so we want to add a filter to filter out those past ones. So we're going to use that date field again. And we'll set it to day. And then we'll say is greater than or equal to relative date, so now. So this is going to change as the date, as the date ticks on, then our events that show on the current and upcoming events page are going to change. And I might say minus one day because uh, we possibly want to show day the event from, you know, from today if someone's looking at the website and they're about to go to the event. So let's save that one. And this is actually not the date that we set. This is a submitted date. So we can't really tell whether it's working. You'll just have to trust me that it is working. Um, and if we save this one, you'll see that we've now got this events tab in our main menu. So here's all of our upcoming events. And I don't know, I think this is kind of ugly, this display. So the first thing perhaps I want to do is for the very first event on this page, I want to show the full event instead of showing the teaser. So if we have a look, we're showing content and we're showing teaser. So I'm going to add an attachment to my view. And 
I'm going to change this pager so it's only going to show one item and I'm just going to change it for this attachment. And then I'm also going to change this teaser for the attachment to show the full node. So this is our full node for this first event and then I'm going to attach it to the page that we created before. And now if we have a look at our page, you'll see that this event is appearing twice. So we can fix that by editing our page settings over here and creating an offset of one. So it means that it's gonna skip the first item because we've already printed it in the attachment. And there we go, we've got our full event and then we've got the little short teaser display of the upcoming events. So let's save this one. And if we refresh our events page, it should have reflected over here. So this is still kind of a bit ugly because we've got this stupid date label and the address label. So I'm going to enable a module called Display Suite. And this is another really awesome module for taking control of how your nodes look when presented in different contexts. So for example, here we've got a teaser display mode and then we've got a full node display, no display mode here. And we want to you can control them with the default Drupal stuff, but Display Suite gives you heaps more uh, control over what they look like. So if we refresh this, we should get the Display Suite link. So I'm going to manage the display of our events. And I'm just going to do the default one to start with. So this will be kind of for our full node. So I'm going to go with two columns stacked, I think. So this is, we get regions to put stuff in our node. I'll save that one. And I think maybe if we put the body in the right and then the date and the address in the left. And then we'll put the title up in the header. So that looks a little bit better, but we probably want to turn off the labels so we can hide those labels on those fields. And that's kind of looking a bit nicer. We just could do with some CSS, but that's sort of the next step is to skin your site with some CSS. So I also want to change the teaser. So if I switch over to my teaser here, um, I might just go with a one column layout. And I don't think I want to show the text. I think I might just want to show the date of the event and the title and then perhaps a read more event, a read more link so that they can click through to the full details. So we'll save this one. And then if we refresh our page over here and it hasn't generated any, oh no, it has generated dates. It just hasn't generated the, nope, I haven't even set the address. So I'm gonna hide this title. There we go. So already we're kind of, we're kind of getting there with our events page. Um, to take this a step further, you might want to install one of the calendar modules and have an events calendar to kind of second step. And yeah, a bit of CSS would probably make this look pretty presentable as an events page. So now I'm going to add a past events page so that users can see all of the awesome past events that we've held on our website. So go back to my view and I'm going to add another page. And I'm actually going to change this display here. This is just an administration name. So it just kind of makes it a bit easier when you're, if you've got a view with a whole lot of displays to see what's going on. And I'm going to update this pager so that it's not skipping one anymore because I don't, I just want to show the teasers for my event. And let's update this date to be less than or equal to now. And I'm also going to enable the menu module. Because I want to give this a menu link and it also needs a path because you can see that it's got some validation errors here. So let's just call it event slash archive and we'll give it a menu entry called past events 
in our main menu. And I discovered that Drupal does something kind of cool the other day. So I'm pretty sure it does it because I've given it a path of events, which is our which was our original events page and then slash archive. But if we have a look at our menu links, it's actually set this as a submenu of events, which I thought was pretty cool because I don't think it used to do that in Drupal 6. So at the moment, though, we've got no way of, s way of seeing our secondary links. So if we go into the home page, we still only see our events page, so no one can get to that past events unless they know the address. So I'm going to enable a module called context. And I think it's a UI module as well. So context is kind of a cool module because it lets you, um, I mainly use it for laying out blocks, but it lets you do kind of conditions and reactions. So we're going to add a context for every page except for the front page. So I'll just call it layout, not front. And we're going to go with path. And you use the tilde to say not, and then the front is kind of special. So it looks like that in the... Uh, triangle brackets and then we're going to add a block which is our main menu and let's add that to the first sidebar so if we visit our home page you'll see that we don't have the menu but then if we visit a page that's not the home page we have this menu here and I kind of don't like that this menu starts with the word the main menu because it's I mean, it's just the menu. People don't need to know that it's the main menu. So I'm going to enable another module called Menu Blocks. And this one lets you kind of gives you more control over your menu. So let's add one and we'll call it Main Menu Secondary. And let's say we'll start from the first level and we're going to give it unlimited depth. So if we go back to our context and edit this one and add our new menu block that we've created. Oops, except I think I want to put it where the other one is. And then we'll go back to our events page. So oh, I think I need to configure it slightly differently. So I actually want to start from the second level. Yeah, that's better. So now we've got our events, which is kind of our the section that we're in the, at the moment. And then we go through, we can get to our past events page that we created before. So we can get rid of that other menu from our context. So there's quite a there's a few reactions that you can use with context. You can um, uh, do some stuff with breadcrumbs. You can uh, turn on and off theme regions, and there's some contrib modules that let you add extra reactions and conditions as well. So for now, I'm just going to delete this main menu that I don't want. So I think our events is pretty much done. And I'm going to now, we're going to go uh, create a, a blog section or a news section. So let me, I've already done some of the hard work. So for this, I'm using a module called Features. And this is another one that I use like every day. It's, um, it kind of lets you make your own modules uh, that package up things like use content types uh, and configuration that you can then reinstall onto other sites, but you don't need to know any code at all. So you just create it all through the Drupal interface and then download it, and then you can put that into the custom modules directory on a new site, and it's all there and enabled. So that's definitely, if you're kind of sort of an int, you know, beginner intermediate, it's a really good one to have a look at because it cuts you down on a lot of work. Because one thing a lot of developers do is, you know, you build a blog for every single site that you build, and it generally works the same, so if you can just you know, click a button and install that with everything, with everything ready to go. Then, that's going to save you heaps of time. 
and you can spend more time on theming and kind of doing the fun stuff. So I have a content type called blog and I've given it just some basic fields, title, body and image. And I've also started this blog view. So we've just got a page called blog and it's got a page in the menu. So um, we actually want to add some tags to our blog. So we're going to use the Drupal module called taxonomy for that. So I'm going to add a vocabulary. So vocabularies are kind of sets of tags, of, of uh, sets of terms. So this one is going to be called tags. So I could have another taxonomy called colors, which holds all of my color terms, but um, we're just going to keep this one generic. So generally you use taxonomy for classifying stuff. Anytime you want to classify content into some sort of organized set, then tags is probably a good thing to use. Um, so let's generate some terms. And 10 is okay. So it's created us a bunch of tags. Um, but still we can't tag our blog content with these tags because we have to add another field to the content type. So we need to add a term reference field. And we're going to go with autocomplete term widget tagging, which means that when the user creates a blog post, they can create new tags on the fly. So they don't need to have been already created into our tags. If you set it as one of the other options, that's a way that you can set the exact tags that the user can choose from and they can't create any new ones. So save this one. And I'm just going to let them add as many tags as they want. So if we now create a blog post and give it some text and then a couple of tags. So there's our tags down the bottom and this has actually created these tags for us in the in our tags vocabulary. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add a display to our view that lets you filter these blog posts by tag. I should say that I think the Drupal blog module does all of this for you, but this is kind of a really good way of um, getting your head around some of the more advanced view stuff. So we're going to add a page display. And we're going to give it a path and I'm going to call it blog and then tags. And then I'm going to use this percent, which is going to substitute in for whichever tag it is we're looking at at the moment. So say we're looking at our tag called music. Uh, the URL is going to be blog slash tag slash music. So under the advanced tab, there's something called contextual filters. And this is where view becomes a little bit complicated. So I'm going to add taxonomy term ID as a contextual filter. And I'm going to also override the title of the page. So let's call it blog posts. And percent one is our argument, so that's going to substitute in the term names. So I think we should probably generate some blog content so that we've got some stuff to work with. So let's do that over here. And perhaps let's add them back a month ago. So currently this is showing all of our blog posts, but you've got this contextual filters box here where you can update your preview. So if we have a look at our tags taxonomy um, and we grab one of these term IDs, so say this one is taxonomy term seven. So if we put seven in here and this is now showing our blog posts tagged with PR. So Let's save this view. And still, we don't have any way of the users accessing these tags. That's kind of a bit annoying because they can't filter the blog posts by the tags. So we're going to add another display. Uh, we're going to add a block. 
So unlike pages, blocks don't have to have a path. They're just a little, it's a block that you can uh, attach to another page. So what I should have done, possibly, is remove this argument from this page. So we just have to make a little change into this one. We're going to display a summary and we're going to sort it ascending. And we also need to put in our base path, which was blog slash tags. And we only want to do it for this block. So there we've got kind of a nice menu of all of our tags. And each of these is going to link to the page of each of those uh, each of those tags used. So let's save this. And we're going to go back to context module. And I think I want this block to show on my entire blog section. So I'm going to add a path. And I'm going to use the path blog and blog slash star. So the star is a wildcard. So that means that any path that comes after blog as well as the, the root blog is going to show this block. So then we're going to add our use block. And this is a good reason why you should give your view displays useful names because at the moment this just says view blog. And I know that this is the block that I've created, but if you had a whole lot of views, then it gets a little bit confusing. So if we add that in there and we have a look at our blog. So here's our nice tags menu. If we have a look at, uh, say, music, so here's our post that we tagged with music earlier. And then there's a few other posts that have been tagged with music as well. So I think that's all I want to do in the blog section. But let me just check that I haven't missed something out. Nope, that's it. So uh, the next thing that we're going to create, and this is the last little bit, is a featured content block. And I'm going to use a module called Bean, which is kind of cool. So what Bean lets you do is to create block types. So the same way we've been creating content types, you can create a block type and add fields to it. So if we refresh this, um, you can do what Bean does with, uh, with kind of content types, but then your content type is actually going to be a page, whereas we really want ours to be a block. We don't want it to have a page of its own because, I mean, a block doesn't have to have its own separate page. So we will go to structure block types. Featured content block. And let's give it some fields. And ah, oh, we can't give it fields. Now, this is a good example of why you need to clear the cache regularly. <laughs> because um, obviously, some stuff that being installed kind of hasn't kicked in yet. So if you want to clear the cache and you don't have Drush, you go to Configuration Development Performance. And there is a clear all caches button. So if you're having problems with your Drupal website, the first step is always to clear the cache before you start panicking because it might fix things. And it has because now we can add some fields. So let's go with an image here. And oops, forgot to select the field type. And we just want to let them upload one image. And then if we maybe add a body field too, so they can add a bit of text. And because I want this block to feature some content elsewhere on the site, I'm also going to add a link so that users can click through from this, uh, this little block to the content that you want to promote. So I'm going to enable a module called Entity Reference. An entity is, well, that's a hard one to explain. I think it's in the first part of my notes. Um, so a node is an entity, like when you create a blog node, that's an entity. A block is an entity. A user is an entity. So it's kind of like, I guess it's just a, a thing a that can be a collection of fields. Um, a taxonomy term is also an entity. So I don't know if anyone's got a really good explanation of an entity. 
<laughs> so if we refresh this one. So Yep. It's kind of yeah, it's it's a it's a weird one to explain. So we're going to choose entity reference here, um, and this is going to let us choose a another page on our website. So we're going to be able to. We're just going to let them choose whatever content type they want, and only one value. So if we now add a block. So we're going to promote our upcoming show and I don't know, let's say come to our CD launch and we're going to give it an image and a little bit of body text and here's a link of all of our nodes on our website. So <coughs> let's just choose our album world premiere event. So this looks a little bit ugly, but we can fix that with Display Suite. So what I think I want to do with my block is I want to give the users a choice of whether they want to have the image on the left or the right of their featured block. So I'm actually going to add a new view mode, actually a couple of view modes. So So let's call this one Featured Content Image Left and we'll let it apply to B. And then add another one. Call this one Image Right. And let's manage the display of our Featured Content block. And we'll go with a two column stack again, that's one of my favourites. And we'll keep the title in the header. And then we'll go with, so this one, actually, we're, we're just doing the default one. So we'll just kind of go with the image on the left as a default. And then our body and link on the right. And then we want to go to custom display settings. And we want to give custom display settings for our two new view modes. So image left is still OK. Oh, no. And then we're going to do the same thing for the right. Oops. You actually have to choose one of these layouts to let Display Suite take over because otherwise you're just using the Drupal defaults. So even if you just want one column, you can choose one column. So this one is going our body and link on the left and our image on the right. So now I might add a, um, a front page context just so we can put our block onto the front page. And themes, here's our upcoming show theme. So let's put it into the highlighted content. And if we have a look at our home page, currently we've got this default layout, which was the image on the left, but if we edit that one, we can choose one of our um, other, we can choose our image on the right view mode and save that. And if we refresh our home page, there you go, it's switched around. So that kind of gives you users options 
without needing to be designers and lay out the page themselves. They've got a few set options that you've created. And that is the end of the site building for now. So I might just go through, um, how long have I got? Another five minutes? I think, yeah, okay. Yeah, so maybe if there's any questions. Um, can I upload them to the DrupalCon website? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I'll put them there. Otherwise, if I can't upload them, I'll put a link on the session page to a Google Doc. Yeah, okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, it's a little, it's a, a little application, free one called Little Ipsum. So it's for OS X, and it just lets you copy two words or a couple of sentences or a couple of paragraphs. So it's pretty. That one's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like this one for site building. This one, the admin menu, because it's really quick to access all the links. But for um, end users, I usually use admin because you can add your own blocks to that. That gives you a little, like it's a funny toolbar on the side and then it expands out from the side. Um, I don't really like the default Drupal toolbar, but that's just my preference. Some people really like it. It looks nicer than these ones, but I just find that it's too hard to add stuff into it. Yeah. Um, I don't ever use the core block system personally, so you can, useless it's not useless, so it's just, you get more control and you can do this, you can do the same but more with those modules. And I could have demonstrated the core stuff, but there's plenty of documentation out there on, you know, setting up Drupal with the core stuff. So you can do what I did when you add a, you want to add a block to the front page, you can do it from the blocks configuration, but say you only wanted to add a block to the front page for uh, logged in users, you can't do that through the Drupal default block. So you need to then use a module like context and add your user role context in there. Can you just summarise those modules in a sentence? Yep. Um, I'll go to my slides. So admin and admin menu are good for administration, but um, module toolbar. Bean. I did, Bean's a pretty new one and I'm only just getting into it, but I like it because it just gives you a block and you don't have to worry about trying to make your node into a block some other way if you want to display it as a block. Um, Ctools is a dependency for a whole lot of useful modules, Devel and Devel Generate. Display Suite, this is, um, that's one of my favourite modules because you can do so much stuff with the, um, with the layout of your node and once you get into the more advanced features, you can use tokens so you can kind of generate your own displays for certain fields by substituting in data. So if you, you know, maybe you had your author field, but you wanted it to say um, this, you know, this post was posted on date by the author and you want it to be slightly different to the way that the Drupal one does it, you can create your own custom field and then add that into the display suite layout. You can also add in uh, views blocks in right into your content with display suite. So if you want to have, you've got a couple of fields and then you want the fields and then you want another, a view block underneath some fields and then some more fields, you can chuck that in there with display suite too, which is pretty useful. Uh, views, that's really important one and that's probably one of the first ones that you, you should learn because, I mean, any anytime you want a list of any sort of content, then views is the module to go to context, so that's kind of, I use it mainly for layout, so you conditional conditions and reactions. Uh, web forms, so web forms are a nice little contrib module that lets you create forms that users can fill in and then uh, you can view the responses on your 
website. That one's pretty easy to set up. You just install it and then you create a new form and it gives you a page with the form. Um, so you can use that for a contact form or yeah, sign up form for an event. Um, and then these are just some kind of field modules. So date lets you have date fields, link and email. So that will validate uh, links and emails for users. If they, so they don't put in dodgy um, emails that don't, that aren't a real email. Entity reference, so that lets you choose another entity on your site from a field. So that could be a user or a node or a bean or a term. Um, address field, we saw that one that kind of lets you insert a full address. Real name is a useful one if you've got lots of users who are kind of creating content on your site because it lets you put in um, fields like first name, last name, I don't know, title if they're a doctor, and then it it uh, puts them all together to create a real name field. So that will display instead of the username, wherever the user's name is displayed. That one's kind of in the, if you don't have that, then you've got to, every time you make a view, if you want to show the user's full name, you've got to get each field for the first name, last name. One minute, thank you. Oh, that's there. Uh, libraries, um, that's, that's kind of essential if you're using any external libraries, so it doesn't really do anything by itself. Token is a good one because a token is kind of like using, um, using a token to substitute in for real data, so you wanted to, maybe you've got your username token, so you want to use that on the user's profile page, so you, like whichever profile page you're viewing, you want to display that user's name, so you can use token to substitute in that data. And then rules is kind of a, is a good one and it's a little bit complex to set up, but it's useful. So you can, uh, it's, I mean, it's just conditions and actions. So, whoops, my examples, uh, get back to the slide. Um, send an email to all site admins when a news node is created or updated. So you can do that with rules or unpublish a node if it has not been edited for over two weeks. There's some examples of rules. WYSIWYG, so we saw that one. Um, field groups are useful one. It lets you put uh, fields into a group of fields. It's kind of useful for laying out nodes. Um, menu block, we saw that one. Gives you more control over your menus. And that's it. And I'll just say that there is a part three of these slides which is about getting help, but again, you can read those ones later.